I'm Scott Martin, President and CEO of the Norman Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate each of you carving out a little bit of time of, in your evening to be with us this evening. Certainly appreciate the candidates uh, for making time to uh, be with your constituents and to share your thoughts on the issues. So before we get too, too deep into this, will you help me thank our candidates for being here? Just a few of the ground rules for this evening, a little bit of information. Uh, we are recording this, Lord willing, IT will work out as planned, and uh, our our hopes is to be able to post this in the previous form that we had uh, earlier this afternoon on social media tomorrow. So if you uh, miss something this evening, you want to go back and watch it, or we'll share it with some of your friends, there will be an opportunity to do that at some point in time tomorrow. We hope that we can get this um, live and on social media. And to our candidates, just a little bit of uh, ground rules about how we're going to do this. Uh, one, one reason why I'm using the microphone is for the recording. So I'm going to be passing this back and forth, okay? I ask that you each utilize this and uh, speak into it so that the recording will hopefully be as loud as possible. We have that speaker over there. As to the questions and answers. Uh, we are going to dismiss with an opening statement, jump right into the questions, and when we get there, I am, you will each be allowed two minutes per question. Uh, one of my colleagues, the red shirt back there, she's got two cards. When you have 15 seconds left, she's going to give you a yellow card. When your time runs out, you're going to get a red card. So I'm going to throw something at you if you keep talking. Okay, no. uh, but try to be respectful of your time. And uh, that way we can get through as many of our questions as possible. And I tried to uh, give you a little bit more time so that you can dig a little deeper into your thoughts and answers. Uh, so hopefully two minutes is enough. At the end, we will uh, close with your closing thoughts. You will get 60 seconds for that. And then uh, same will apply 15 seconds for yellow card when you have that left and then the red card after. So, to our candidates, we are honored to have with us this evening Jeff DeSnooks, Ray Howerton, and Matt Peacock, three of the five candidates for Ward 2. As a reminder, and I'll hopefully we'll do this at the end, to all of you out there, the election is February 13th, next Tuesday. Uh, you can vote early in person, though, this Friday and Thursday and Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m at the Cleveland County Election Board, Moore Norman Technology Center, South Penn Campus, and I think, uh, if I read recently, I think they may have even opened another site at the Noble Public Library. And then, of course, the polls will be open next Tuesday, February 13th, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, let's uh, jump right into these questions, and um, so we'll get after it. So, regardless of where you live or what you do, homelessness is arguably the most discussed issue in Norman. So let's begin with three questions concerning this issue. And I've asked that you keep this first question, yes or no. The next two, you'll be able to um, really share more thoughts uh, in regard to the issue. I promise I'm not going to leave you hanging with just yes or no. So the first question is simply yes or no. You'll have uh, more time. So the first question, will you oppose further expansion of the Gray Street Shelter? Yes or no, and then we'll get into some more details in a second. Yes or no? Uh, yes, I'm gonna oppose. Repeat the question again. Will you oppose further expansion of the Gray Street Shelter? No. Yes and no. Okay, and we can hear more about that. Okay. And I am going to try to uh, shift who starts. So, sorry, Jeff, that was a short start, but we're going to go to Ray next, and then we'll come back to you for more questions. On the so, uh, Ray, to begin with you, what should happen to the Gray Street Shelter? We should pay it and modernize it to where it fits best for the people that need it the most. We need to provide services 
not even to just basic human needs, but to get them retrained, reworked, retooled, reskilled, and try to make them an active member of society. And that's what I'd like to see that shelter become part of. Yeah, so I, I do support a 24-hour shelter, but I don't think a downtown is an appropriate place for it. Uh, the reason I said yes and no is because uh, currently that building is full of asbestos, and so the city has to spend money on asbestos to remove it. Currently, we are spending $15,000 a month on fire watch because that building does not have a sprinkler system. So adding a sprinkler system is a value add to the building and financially responsible thing to do because spending $15,000 a month opening is not. Uh, the reason why I would be against it is because I think that real estate is soon to be beachfront property as James Garner Avenue gets redone, as Main Street gets uh, converted to 2A, as the Regional Transit Authority comes online and the commuter rail becomes active. Uh, I don't think that property is, I don't think a homeless shelter in that property is the highest and best use at that point. So that's really the part I'm wrestling with. Um, I'm really looking forward to a staff presentation that we're going to have at our next council meeting that will really talk about what the cost benefit analysis of that program, uh, but really right now, I just don't feel like I have enough details to make. So I think a lot of people would be surprised when I say that I would oppose that knowing my background. I've worked in behavioral health for a number of years, and I'm an expert in, in this area across the state, or so so to speak, people, people have called me that. And I've certainly worked in this area quite a bit. We haven't done this right. The way we've done this with placing that shelter on Gray Street and actually everything that Matt was talking about, we put it in a place where it's just just setting up for, for negative consequences and further stigmatization of, of these issues. Uh, it is placed in a building that doesn't have the safety features that it has. It does not have wraparound services, so we aren't going to be able to expand that. Now, the other part of this that I would bring up is I actually don't support city funds funding a 24-hour shelter. Uh, and the reason is, is because I think there are other funds that, that need to come into this. I think that nonprofits can do this. I've worked a lot with the Homeless Alliance up in Oklahoma City. I love the way they do that and, and how they put that shelter together, how they have the wraparound services, job training, and, and other opportunities. Everything that we do with working with an unhoused population needs to have a path out of homelessness. There are many different things that we can bring in. Uh, and work to help do job training, help uh, link people into services. And frankly, if we do that, we can build a workforce in this community and, and help people integrate and be part of one. Thank you. So I want to make sure that uh, because this issue is so talked about and, and I think complex, um, I want to make sure that you each have any additional time or up to two minutes that you would to say anything further, say anything further about the issue. So long term, how do you propose to address homelessness in Norman? Matt, we're going to start with you. Is it, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Is it? it, it we've, got batteries. we've got batteries in the back of the room we put it too, so yeah, bring it back up. Testing. Okay. Sorry, which one has got 
I'll just suggest that the previous candidates were very long-winded and uh, <laughs> ran the battery. So, um, right, there we go. Okay, we that's fantastic. Okay, go ahead. Good. Okay, so back to the question. We're going to get, I'm going to restate it. So right here. Walter, how do you propose to address homelessness in Norman? So this is on top of what we've already discussed. So homelessness is not unique to Norman. It's actually a nationwide crisis, but there are a lot of things that we can do locally to start to try to address it. Um, the first being better collaboration with the state and county on this issue. There's actually a state statute titled Section 53, uh, State Statute 53, Section 6, that says that the responsibility of the indigent is actually that of the county. And currently, I don't feel like they're uh, actually fulfilling that obligation. So a better collaboration with the county would be my first step. Uh, beyond that, according to our home-based action plan, the biggest thing we can do is build affordable housing. And when I say affordable housing, I don't mean Section 8. I don't mean homeless housing. I mean affordable housing. And in Norman, that's a threshold of $1,200 per month. This is teachers, firefighters, and municipal workers. This is not homeless. Beyond that, what we can do is invest more in mental health and drug, drug addiction treatment. Um, I've got a, a very strong opinion that doing nothing is not a solution and saying it's somebody else's responsibility isn't a solution. And I keep hearing about all these other entities that need to step up and fix this problem, but it's still a problem. We still have the problem. And so until everybody steps up and actually solves it, I feel like the city is the only one that had, well, the city is the one who has the responsibility to fix it at this point. And so I am willing to put my efforts and my resources into making that happen. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do and a responsible thing to do. There's been weak leadership in the city taking care of the situation. We've had strong leadership by now directing all the entities that we have, the different partnerships, the different community involvement, and actually trying to get people to become more involved in helping this situation because it affects everybody in the community. It's not just one person's problem. It's not one business problem. It's not one family problem. It's everybody's problem. And it takes everybody to fix it. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And we all need to get together and work things out. Work things out. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. Think how happy we'd be if we could learn to work together. I'm going to echo uh, what my uh, my colleagues have, have said here, uh, and I agree with what they're what they're talking about. One of the things that we do need to look at first is affordable housing, but we also need to look at supportive housing and some of the things that we're really doing well here in, here in Norman. I work with a couple of groups, Thunderbird Clubhouse, Transition House, and others who are really working well in this space, who are doing incredible things. I think we need to partner with those nonprofits. And, and help them expand what they're what they are doing. Uh, there are other groups that we need to bring in. I just heard about uh, last week in, in talking to some folks in you know, the, the city that Mental Health Association is coming in. This is a group, Scott, you've heard me talk about Mental Health Association before, and this is a group that I've been begging to get into our community. They do incredible work uh, in this area that just look at their cost of projects and what they've done with, with their housing. Uh, in that area, but there are others also that we can bring in. Uh, we need to understand this and we need to understand what this, who this population is uh, and get a better picture of our, across our community so that they also understand. We're talking about women fleeing domestic violence situations. We're talking about transition age youth who don't have supports that many of us take for granted. There are so many different people. This is you and me. Uh, we've just had an adverse circumstance in our life, and we need to realize this. Now, when we do talk about uh, bringing in these other resources and, and taking on that responsibility, I don't think we need to be creating services, but I do think we need to make those services that we have in our community work. And that's where I come in, and I think I bring something to this discussion, and that I know who these people are, and I know how to, to make them partner and start delivering the services that are promised. Good. Okay, Jeff, we're we're back to you. Uh, we're back to you with this question. I'm not sure this is working. Do you guys hear it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just put it off. Maybe. Yeah, let's do that. But I'll keep going. Now. We're gonna. Go. So, we can hear you. Now. You all are here, so we're gonna honor your time. 
Um, you mentioned housing, some of you have. Norman is expected to grow at a rate of 1.5% over the next 25 years, reaching over 185,000 people by the year 2045. We're not on pace to have housing for that growth. In addition, housing experts recommend we not focus on any one kind of housing, but rather encourage all forms of housing. How do you propose to address our housing needs? Well, I think that is one of the things that we were talking about, uh, and as we bring in opportunities for development, we really need to work, and, and I know what we're saying is not to focus on one sort of housing, but we definitely need to be focusing on development of more affordable housing in this community, but not just single family dwellings. We need other opportunities, and certainly and still a little bit from Matt, what I've, I've heard him talk about before, that, that I think many people would get on board with here in Norman is also mixed use development and things that we can do moving forward to really attract different people into our community. We need to make a, a, make this a, a community in which all people can live. I can't even imagine, I have a son who uh, just recently purchased his first home and it was very different uh, than, than when I remember my wife and I uh, purchasing our first home. Uh, I don't see how young people can come into this community and, and apartments and the rent that we have is, is really shuts people out of being able to come into the community, but that also hurts us in our growth with being able to attract workforce and, and really bring the people in and the resources into this community that we want to see as we grow. And certainly uh, with just locations throughout the community, we're going to be moving east. And we really need to, to get in front of that and think about the infrastructure pieces that we're going to need moving forward if we're going to develop these areas. Okay. We definitely need affordable housing. Um, Norman High School worked with uh, OU with a pilot program, airplane program. We could get uh, work with like Norman Boat Tech and help work with the Boat Tech students to get them experience building houses, electrician work, plumbing work, and stuff like that. Win win to help build this. The biggest problem facing Norman is we don't have a lot of land left. You do, but and trying to protect it from around the lake, the east side of the lake. You can't go west, northwest past 36 and Robinson. It's too flat. I used to race cars up there in high school. I can tell you the exact quarter mile once you go around that corner north on Webster. But there's no drainage out there. We're going to have to develop in town and we're going to have to build up. We can't build up. There's just no way. You start building up to the north, to the east, you're getting into the watershed of Blue Creek and getting into the watershed of Little River. And you're going to start affecting the water quality of the lake and what we have, and we're going to have to build by water, too. So we have to look at areas within the city that we can actually put in affordable housing for everybody to live. Um, Norman is a community, a uh, university community, and the housing costs have always been driven by the university. And so that affects Norman also. But it is very difficult to live here in the city. It's very expensive. And right now, from where I paint, moved out of Arlington, Texas from, the city's moving out, and it's taking too long to get here, there, and everywhere. And we need to start bringing this back in and bringing everything in and bringing services and uh, stores and building and everything to the people inside the city. Matt, we're to try to mic that. Yeah, so like it's kind of been alluded to already, we just need to make more efficient use of our land, which is our most one of our most finite resources. Uh, we need to look at combating sprawl and fringes. We need to be more intentional with density. We need to build projects like ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units. Uh, that means basically a, an, an additional unit on an existing piece of property. Uh, granny flats have heard them used as transitional housing, uh, aging in place, young professionals. Uh, we need to build pattern zoning. Uh, what that is is basically pre-approved building plans. Uh, what that does is it makes the, the approval process faster. It removes the need for rezoning. It removes the need for architect. Being an architect, it pains me to say that. Uh, but all of this with the goal of bringing down the overall cost of the housing. And so bringing down the cost, passing those savings on to the consumer, I think that is how we get to housing, uh, how we get a large quantity of housing. Uh, as was mentioned over here, building mixed use projects with a light touch of density, I think was really uh, smart and forward thinking. We need to push quality infill development so that investment in the core of Norman 
offsets the demand to build out in Ward 5, offsets the demand to build out in 10 mile flats. Um, related to all of that, we also need to figure out our other finite resource, and that's water. Uh, water is life, and we're really pushing the limits of that infrastructure. And since if we cannot um, secure that source, we can't sustain that growth. And really, we just cannot uh, sustain the, the future development. Okay, Ray, we're going to begin with you with this question. Norman is blessed with many distinctive business districts, such as downtown, Campus Corner, and Brookhaven Square, to name just three. As a city council member, what would you do to support all districts in Norman? Well, they each have their, they each have their unique personality and blend. Uh, campus Corner is Campus Corner, man. I remember... Oh, Cindy sitting down there in front of Town Tavern and walking around there and having a good time. I saw Tom Penny at Boomer Theater. Um, so it has a unique draw to the college kids where, like Brookhaven, Brookhaven was always some rich spot in town when I was growing up, or uh, Hall Park. And so they have their neck each unique. Downtown Norman, Man, I lost my pup. I used to play billiards in. I think there's a dispensary there now. But the downtown, we need to keep it because it has a great history to it. It has a vibrant history to it. And we can really make it an attraction to people to come down and see what Norman's all about. Yeah, so uh, much, much like Mr. Howard said, I think we leverage the events and the uh, unique uh, characteristics of each of those districts. They already have ready-made identities, and so why reinvent that wheel? Uh, let's take what is working and enhance it, much like Oklahoma City has done with the Plaza, the Paseo, Uptown, Midtown, <coughs> Downtown, Capitol Hill. Uh, these were districts that were already districts, and they just took, put some branding and some marketing behind them, gave it a budget, gave it an executive director, director and really elevated the district as a whole. Um, our, our, the ones that we have here in Norman, like I just mentioned, Main Street being the Walker Art District and the home second Friday. Uh, Campus Corner being the most urban place in the entire state. Flood and Acres being an automotive district with some really cool warehouse buildings. I think there's some really great bones in Norman that we just need to take advantage of. And so some more tangible ideas would be to revive the bid discussions, business improvement district discussions, uh, to really, again, really put a budget, a direct <coughs> budget for one of these. Uh, creating an incentive program for startups, uh, much like the Startup 405 Incubator. And then uh, lastly, a TIP district master plan that allows these districts to not only work in tandem, but feed off each other. And so I think investing in a, in a holistic plan that also invests in our alleys, our sidewalks, our leftover spaces, and really just makes the most of what we have already. We've talked a lot about development in Norman and the different things that we can do. I think we have a lot of exciting opportunities, but we can't do that to the detriment of core Norman. We really need to invest in Lindsay Street, Main Street, ensure that we're growing those opportunities. It's important that we're investing in downtown, investing in Campus Corner, and we have significant opportunity on the east side for development as my old employer uh, is ready to sell quite a bit of land. Uh, we need to be able to, to take advantage of that and ensure that we develop it the right way. I certainly look to incentive funding in these districts and really working with the business owners in these different areas of our community to see what their vision is. What is it that is hindering them from being able to, to operate in the way that they need to? Because we're still losing too many people out of Norman. Uh, and we need to really be attracting in business and providing different incentives for businesses to come in and attract the type of workforce, again, that we want within the community and start thinking about the different things that can happen. I, you know, I worry about people as they move out of districts from one district to another. We need to make sure that we're revitalizing that space that has been, been empty uh, and provide that opportunity to, to develop that and move forward. Thriving business districts create sales tax revenue for the city. So this next question is about that. Sales tax is the primary source of revenue for cities in Oklahoma. What is one city policy to drive sales tax generation and growth for Norman that you would be supportive of? Matt, we'll begin with you. So, short answer is to promote policies that build housing. 
Why is that? Uh, because up until a couple of years ago, the only way that the city of Norman could collect sales tax was to chase commercial sales, meaning that we had to chase every strip center, every big box store, every commercial entity that would produce sales tax. Uh, recently, Norman was able to start collecting taxes on online purchases. So, meaning if you order something off Amazon, you have it delivered to your house, Norman collects the sales tax off that. So, rooftops act as revenue centers now. And so we should be building housing above all else. Not only does it add population to our city, which will net a direct sales tax benefit, but housing is such a dire need that this approach just happens to kill multiple birds with one stone. And that's exactly why we need to go all in on new housing in Norman of all shapes and sizes. The town has always been, been dependent on the residents to fund what the city drives. You have to build the residency. It's the only way you're going to build the tax base. Um, I wish I could say Norman had a lot of things going for it. It does. But the thing that would drive Norman and building the tax base is to increase the Norman public school system and make it best in the state. And that would bring people in here because we're a bedroom community. People work outside of Oklahoma, outside of Norman. You drive to the city. Uh, a lot of people do have businesses in here, and we need to support this. We need to support our locally owned businesses. We have to make them attractive to where they bring people in. And they bring new business in and new, how, new, new residents to the city to pay the taxes. So we can keep improving and keep moving forward with our businesses. Or local home businesses. I'm not into big chain stores or anything like that. You won't find me eating eating at a chain restaurant. You'll find me at well, I wish Sooner Dairy Lunch was still open, but um, you'll find me eating at mom and pop places. You'll find me going into. I may you know have to point at the menu because I don't understand the language quite yet and learn how to eat food. And just that that's how we have to do and grow. We have to support each other. In doing that, we make the half Norman attractive to bring in more residents and bring in more diversity and bring in more culture. Um, it's what this town needs. It's you know we need to make it really attractive for everybody, and to do that, we have to promote our local businesses. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. Uh, I agree. We need to be able to bring people into Norman, and the housing issue ties into everything else. But we also what we had already talked about before provide those incentives for those different businesses so we can help attract jobs. I'm an employer up in Oklahoma City. I would like to be an employer in Norman, but there are a lot of things that are going for me <clears throat> in Oklahoma City that I can't do here. I play, pay significantly less rent in Oklahoma City than what I can pay here. These are jobs that I would, would like to bring down, but my employees can't afford to live here uh, as we go through this. So it's, it's a constant work, I think, moving forward. This, this has to be a regular <coughs> discussion a one-time thing when we talk about it. This has to be a constant discussion throughout the city and, and potentially pulling together uh, more people to help make this decision other than just council members, bringing together uh, members of the community to really uh, provide that input, study the issue, and, and see where we can go. <clears throat> Jeff, I think we're back to you as we're starting this round. So tax increment financing districts have been successful in Norman, on Campus Corner, New York's North Park, and in the Center City. So much so, the council is currently discussing a citywide TIF master plan. Would you support the use of TIFs for development in other areas of Norman? And you can expand on that after you, you know, whatever your thoughts are. It's not just yes or no. It's not just yes. Yes, absolutely. But it's also something that I think we have to look at and make sure that's the kind of source that we need to utilize. I'm like a lot of people, and my first experience with TIFs was what we had going on out at, out at North Park. And there were a lot of people in the community who weren't very happy with what was happening at North, North Park. But as I've come to understand, that these are, are things that we can really use to move forward, advance space where we're not necessarily collecting. Uh, tax revenue right now uh, and set us up for the future. There are many opportunities with this, and that's not the only thing that I think we can utilize, but I do think we have to look at this if we're really going to attract new, new opportunities. And we need to invest so that we can bring more money into the community, and we need to make smart investments as we go about that and smart decisions. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yes, but no. It just depends on the area of the city it is, it's in. Um, I still like how it's kind of not an overall master plan. We look at each certain area to see if the TIF program would be, actually be beneficial for it. It's, and taxes are so touchy with everybody when it comes to what we want to do with them, how we want to use them, and how we want to attain them. And so that's why I support the TIF. But you know, at the same time, like in UNP, uh, nah, I just I don't understand it really and truly. I don't know how the money is really helping those businesses up there versus taking away from the businesses in an area that's losing the business up in UNP. Uh, Penny Hill, for example, is some place that probably didn't have was part of the TIF district. And they kind of shut down because they just couldn't afford to be there anymore. And so it just, I, I don't know. I just, I'm too torn on to give you an answer. So as the uh, chair of the Business and Community Affairs Committee, uh, this was actually my idea to bring forward a TIP master plan. Uh, I thought it was not only timely because of the UMP arena discussions, but also a must do. I think it's really important that we show the community an overall strategy on how we plan to structure these TIFs uh, and how each of those different districts can start to play off each other and work together in almost a self-feeding ecosystem. I also think it's really important to show the community that we have a commitment to all parts of Norman and that we value an equitable approach for each unique district in Norman. I know UNP TIF is the one at the forefront, uh, but we have a lot of very other promising, uh, very exciting potential TIF districts in the work, and I think um, I think everybody's going to be very excited when they hear what we're talking about. Okay, moving from the general to the specific, from your understanding of the proposed University of North Park Entertainment District, what are your thoughts on the project and are you supporting? Ray, we'll begin with you. I don't support it at all. It's away from the university. It's being built for a university arena, basketball, gymnastics, wrestling. Um, no, it's taken away from Fort Norman. It's taken away from the university. Um, I've been places you can, you're going to put more asphalt down. You're going to put more concrete down. You're going to create more runoff. We already have that cord sitting right next to Lloyd Noble. And then where I've been, Texas Rangers, when they built three stadiums, it's been all within a square mile of each other. They went from one parking lot to another parking lot to another parking lot building in their ballpark. We don't need to take OU away from OU and put it out on UMP. So I'm against the arena. I'm against the entertainment district. 8,000 seat arena. Yeah, we may get Darcy Lynn, but Paycom in Oklahoma City was ranked number three by Country Music Association as the music venue here in the United States behind Red Rocks up in Colorado and the Grand Ole Opry. We're going to get Darcy Lynn and they're going to get somebody like, uh, what's a uh, uh, Kelsey, uh, Travis Kelsey girlfriend, uh, whatever her name is. I'm sorry, I can't, I don't, I'm not a fan. So I kind of lost her name up. But no, I'm against it. We need to keep uh, the entertainment district around the university because that's really, that's 25,000 people that are around wanting entertainment, you know? And so why are we making it five or six miles away? Yeah, so I think it's an, it's an intriguing concept, but for me at this point, I feel like uh, I've got more questions than answers on whether or not I didn't support it. Um, for me, the devil's in the details. And so meaning, who carries the risk? Is that the city or the developer? Uh, does this put the general fund at risk? Are we subsidizing this area at the sacrifice of other parts of town? I don't necessarily think that TIFs are inherently evil. Um, I've got, honestly seen Oklahoma City pull off 15 unique TIF districts with no casualty to their general fund. Uh, it's showing that it can be done. But you know, we as council members, we have a, a uh, fiduciary responsibility to protect the treasury of Norman. And so we can't just blindly accept this TIF without properly vetting it. Uh, as an architect, I'm more interested in the site plan. Is it walkable? Is it dense? Is it green? Does it have mixed use? For me, it's less about an arena proper, but what all an arena district could support, like a weather experience, like tournaments at the YFAC, uh, like other unique entertainment draws to Norman. And again, do those come at the expense of other parts of town? 
the southern portion of UMP has proven to be the highest traffic shopping district in the entire state. So I think it's hard to argue the financial success of the area. But an arena district needs to contribute more to the urban fabric than just dollars. And so for me, it's a much more nuanced question of just do I support TIFs, but do I support the holistic plan? So I think when I started in on this, I was a sophomore in against the arena and as I've learned more I'm open to this opportunity and really looking at what we can do uh, do with this I agree a lot of my uh, with Ray and a lot of my decision was focused on just my connection to the university and what I wanted is somebody who goes to athletic events at the university but there this is land that I can see really making a difference if all our questions are, are answered about it I'm worried about access for my 35 and what we're going to do with traffic I understand there's a plan there uh, to make that happen and, and that's something that I think we, we need there's different opportunity uh, within that area to grow that area out it's not doing anything for us now as far as generating revenue and so there's some things that we, need, we can do but it is also something that I know is not just going to be uh, confined to just that location people are going to come into that district and it's going to impact other parts of Norman also but also what I mentioned earlier can't do this at the expense of four million. I mean, if we're going to make a plan to do that, we also need to have our plans moving forward with what we're going to do. Again, Main Street, Lindsay, uh, that's the area that, that really concerns me. What are we going to do to revitalize that and keep that opportunity moving forward to attract business? And what are we doing at the same time with our plan uh, moving forward with Campus Corner downtown? And certainly on that east side, I, I, even though it is not my ward, uh, I am concerned about what happens on the east side that's an area where we just don't have resources and we need to develop those resources for our community to, to thrive that's starting with you utility franchises are operational agreements with the city which solely address access to easements and right-of-ways to the benefit of the utility customers and provide benefit to the city general fund in multiple millions of dollars the Norman Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors has voted to support the og &E franchise election. Will you be joining the Chamber Board and voting yes to approve the og &E franchise election franchise on March 5th? Okay. So long answer short, uh, I support our utilities and franchises and willing to do what is, what is necessary to maintain a high level of service from the city. The high storm in October 2021, my electricity office for almost 13 days. But yes. I absolutely support it, uh, but I also think that we can improve our communication on this so that the, the community really understands what they're voting for. And Jeff, back to you. Uh, Norman Ford. The Public Infrastructure Initiative was adopted in 2015 to fund quality of life projects with a temporary one half of one cent sales tax. If we have extra time, I'm going to give you a three as opposed to top one. How about that? What would be your top three projects in the Norman Forward 2? And if you want to fudge and say four, I don't care. Okay. I think a couple areas, and, and I've seen how this has worked in Oklahoma City. Uh, with their maps projects and i think this is a, a tremendous opportunity in norman as we move forward uh, one of the areas that i talk about is incentive to, to attract in the right business but i would really like to see as we talk about behavioral health issues what can, one of the biggest challenges there is workforce what can we do as far as incentives to help bring not just behavioral health workforce in but medical workforce into the norman we're a community that just doesn't have a lot of specialty care uh, as any and I'm someone who's, who's had to work in that area and help people route uh, into these areas. That's something that I could really see us doing and providing incentive uh, moving forward to partner with some of these organizations that we've been talking about to advance. Uh, Oklahoma City recently did this with uh, their uh, uh, funding of the crisis center. While we don't necessarily need to fund a crisis center, there are things that we can do uh, to really enhance a new crisis center that is already planned for. Norman to, to replace the crisis center that's out on the growth of the property right now. Uh, but certainly working with that workforce, I 
I'm somebody who's worked in youth sports for a number of years, and, and I've looked around at our, our facilities here. I used to, to run the parks for Optimist and doing football and baseball. We didn't have enough fields. Uh, it was three to five of us out there working on fields constantly. We need to invest in this and have better facilities. I, I, I travel around to clones around the country to different locations. Uh, for tournaments. These tournaments are incredible generators, revenue generators for a community. Uh, McKinney, Texas, when I think of that, and in Houston, when we travel down there, they're just all over the country. People have invested in this, and I would like to see us invest more in that and have more of these opportunities for kids within within our community, but also maybe use this to make sure that all kids can participate in these types of sports for Norman and then bring in teams from outside. The music festival and the Ren Fair. Those are two things that I would like to see improved. Uh, I've been to many places and seen too many things and know too much, but we have a lot of room for improvements that we can do to make this Renaissance, make the Renaissance Fair and the music festival attract and bring people in from out of town. And I don't want to take away from downtown, but most music festivals I've gone to would be out someplace along the South Canadian River, out in an open area where people could camp and have a good time in three or four days. Renaissance festivals are usually six to eight weekends long. Uh, the ones I've been to have been in Loxahatchee, Scarborough Fair, Texas Ren Fair, which is down outside of Navarosa, and the Minnesota Ren Fair, which is out of Shackley. And these things are just fantastic to see. And they bring in people from hundreds of miles around every weekend. And the music festivals, you get some top-notch performers that are not really mainstream, but backed off. You can get people in here, and they will spend money all over town. <clears throat> we just we take over town, I should say. So that's two areas I see. Mental health will be one. I'm worried about Central State Hospital and the loss of the mental health facilities, and that's an area that I'd like to see the city pick up and start providing more services. Um, but within that, Norman is an aging population because people come and go, and we're all, and that's, you know, mental health and the, and the aging population, the elderly, make sure that they have what they need to be taken care of. So, thank you. Yeah, so I also look to Oklahoma City quite a bit for how to create a, a quality of life initiative that's successful. Uh, if you look at Maps 1, that was some basic housekeeping items. Maps 2 was all about schools. Maps 3 was their, you know, their large quality of life projects like the Scissor Tail Park, a lot of really great initiatives. And the Maps 4 was a billion dollars of social programs. They had so much success in Maps 1, 2, and 3. By the time they got to Maps 4, they were willing to, they were able to spend money on some wants, not some needs. And so I really like to replicate that in Norman. As it relates to Norman, my preference for Norman Ford 2 would be making the entire slate an ecotourism package. That consists of expanded trails, a weather experience, Lake Thunderbird enhancements, a Canadian river park, equine facilities, a crown jewel of a of reimagined Andrews Park. City Council just approved a, a revised master plan for Andrews Park that was just simply beautiful. Uh, and the, the key behind all these projects is that they generate increased tourism, which increases hotel tax and sales tax collections, the majority of which will be coming from residents outside of Norman. We're going to do one bonus question. So, and I think, uh, Ray, we're, we're going to start with you. If elected, how will you encourage partnerships between the city and other community organizations such as Chamber, University, County, Northern Public Schools, the Regional Health System, or an art? Grab them by the ears and bang their heads together so they understand and work together. It's a cohesiveness, it's cooperation. That's a joke over here, folks. And it's cooperation. It's, it's getting everybody to understand we're all equal. Nobody's better than anybody else. It's going to take everybody's help. If we sit here and look and point fingers, no, you need to be the no, 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 no. Nothing's going to get done. 
is going to take all of us saying, hey, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Not their responsibility or his responsibility or their responsibility. It's our responsibility. Until we can get on the same page and start realizing that what we really have in our dreams is making Norman the best town around. And that's what it takes. It takes that common dream. It takes a, it takes a love one another in the truest form to really get people to come together and work and get that. And we have to put aside our differences. We have to put aside our pettinesses and realize that the city is what's important and everyone is important in the city, not just one entity. So I've been a registered independent for almost 20 years and really pride myself on being a bridge builder and finding common ground with people, especially people that don't agree with me. Uh, I think in Norman, we only have to agree on one thing, that we love this city. Uh, we don't have to agree on anything else, but if our hearts are in it for Norman, I think we'll all come out on the right, on, on top. And so much as Mr. Howerton said, uh, we've just got to bring everybody to the table. We've got to be willing to listen to people that don't agree with us. We've got to be willing to change our perspective. We have to be willing to come across the aisle, um, have some very comfortable, hard conversations. They call them growing pains for a reason. Uh, and if we don't go through growing pains together, we will never grow together. So I very much feel that we need to come to the table together. You know, the divisiveness that I've seen on issues in, in this community is one of the reasons I decided to run. I need to have more civil conversations about about the things that, that collectively we all believe in and, and that we're all working towards. Uh, I've been working in this field for a number of years and, and through my government experience, and, and that's what I've done. Everything is about is about finding common ground and finding solutions. And I've done this not only in Oklahoma, but uh, in Louisiana. Too. If I can do it, do this in Louisiana, I think we can do this, this here. Uh, but. This is really something that I think we ought, we really need to bring the community together and have real discussions and not be afraid of those real discussions. Sit down and talk about the things that make us uncomfortable and that's how we're gonna move forward. Uh, for whatever reason, I think we've lost that in Normandy. That's the reason I came back. And my family and I, we moved away. I've lived in Denver, I've lived in Dallas, uh, I've lived in Los Angeles, but we came back here. We've always wanted to come back it's because of this community and our diversity and, and our willingness to continue to grow that diversity and have those discussions. We need to bring that back. That's a piece of Norman that we absolutely need to step back. But a lot of this is going to be have to be outreach, working with these two different groups to come together. Uh, and it's going to, we can start from the council end, but it has to be the rest of the community. And we also have to bring everybody in and, and give them an opportunity to be part of these discussions. Okay, well, to be fair to our uh, earlier candidates that were here from the other wards, I'm going to close off the formal round of questioning and our, our forum with your closing comments. Um, I think it will be uh, as beneficial to those in attendance to be able to chat with you one-on-one -on -one after the forum's over with, if you're able to say. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time. Melissa and I will not stay super late, but uh, for a little bit longer, we'll be here, and that way you can interact with your uh, your constituents. So this time, uh, we're going to wrap things up with the closing comments. We do have a little extra time, so if you want to take two minutes as opposed to one, that'll be fine by me. Matt, we're going to start with you and, and head this way, and Jeff, you'll wrap it up. So I was sworn into my first term as a council member in July of 2020, which in, in case any of you forgot, was at the uh, height of the coronavirus pandemic and the fallout from the George, George Floyd summer. Uh, over the last four years, I have served during times of extreme partisanship, but I've always maintained my independent voice and found a way to center conversations around what is best for Norman, not what is best for a political party. I'm alumni of Leadership Norman, Leadership Oklahoma City, Leadership Oklahoma, the Nature, Nature Conservancy's Leadership Academy, and the Citizens Police Academy. And I've also served on the board of directors for several nonprofits and as well as a planning commissioner for the city of Norman. Given my professional experience as an architect and small business owner, paired with my civic experience as a planning commissioner, council member, and mayor pro tem, I am confident that I am the only candidate that has the skill set and independent voice needed to lead war, through, war two through these critical times. 
I moved back here in 2017 for my health and my mom's here. She's been 95 and back. Um, when I moved back, I didn't plan on getting involved at all. I mean, I moved away from here in 1980 because this town, I was one of the kids that this didn't hold anything for me. There wasn't anything here for me. I wanted to go out and see and seek and explore and experience life. When I was in high school in 1974, I left Norman High School in May and traveled to Fort St. James, British Columbia, Columbia and lived on the Stewart River starting a ranch for about six months. I had no running water, no electricity, no telephone, especially no outside contact with the world. I lived out in the bush of Alaska. They're making television shows after what I did in high school, what I did in high school, okay? <laughs> that experience right there, living that way of life, it makes you appreciate all aspects of life, not just what anything has. I mean, I had to keep a fire going so I could cook trout. I don't eat trout to today. It's a trash fish. <laughs> so, okay, that's what I had to eat out of the river. I'm sorry, okay? You didn't have a shoot of grouse out of the tree. But um, my experience is not in politics. I worked nights all night. I ran large mainframe computers for all state insurance and Johnson and Johnson. I processed billions of dollars worth of financial information each night and processed thousands of jobs and information systems. We had a schedule to keep. We didn't get you know, stuff comes down if we didn't do this. So one of the big problems, one of the big processes that were past my job was process improvements. And I had to continuously do process improvements. And that's where I feel my pro my job experience will help Norman because I can look at processes and improve them. And plus, I'm a hometown kid. One of the main reasons for me, again, running were the issues with the unhoused and, and with mental health issues, behavioral health issues. And, and that's what I've spent my last 20 years doing. That's what I spend my time doing every day in, in my current profession and bringing these resources together understanding where the, those resources are and how we can move forward to overcome stigma and get people linked in the services that they need, not just so that they can, can start on a path of recovery, but so that they can be well. Uh, there's so much divisive discussion that, that's occurred around these issues, and I believe that with my expertise in this area, I can move us forward as a, as a community and, and know where those resources are and how to connect to those resources. But certainly my experience in government, both at the state and federal level, uh, I believe it gives me the ability uh, to help us as a community find those resources and bring those different resources here to, to Norman, build those partnerships that we need uh, and create opportunity throughout our, our city. Uh, I'm like everybody else and like everybody up here, you know, we just want a thriving city. We want our city to be a place for our families, for our friends, uh, and, and for our neighbors. Something that we can be proud of and that's what I bring to this. I absolutely am, am, am happy that we don't have to run on political party because that shouldn't be this, uh, a decision for any of this. I want to bring my experience for the betterment of everybody, and I want to listen to what everybody has to say so that we can find a direction to go that advances our city. Thank you. Please help me thank our candidates for being with us. And thank each of you for coming out tonight. I realize this was a little truncated from probably what you expected. Uh, as a general reminder, the election is February 13th, a week from tomorrow. You can vote early, though, on February the 8th and 9th from 8 to 6 at the County Election Board off Robinson or at South Peak Campus or Norman Technology Center. Polls will open, though, at 7 a.m. on the 13th and close at 7 p.m. I encourage you to get out and vote. Thank you all for being here, and I appreciate our candidates. I hope you can stay around for a few minutes and engage uh, with those who are here.